Hi, this is Ben with SkyFi Audio, and today it's all about the Audio Research SP3. We just recently completed a full restoration of all three of these units, and we're fortunate to have one of each variety. So we've got on the top an SP3, an SP3A, and an SP3A1. Um, in this video, I'm going to cover uh, some valuable information for current SP3 owners and anybody that is looking to possibly purchase one of these to add to their collection. Um, we're going to be covering the following info, uh, identifying which version you have, production year, uh, availability of accessories at launch, all the features of the unit, um, power on and off considerations, common failure points and recommended proactive service, tube selection and replacement, and lamp replacement. And uh, after this introduction, I'm going to uh, put up a page of timestamps of each because this is going to be fairly long. So if there's a specific section that you're interested in, you can go ahead and jump forward to that. Uh, the information covered in this video has been gained from a variety of sources, including communication with audio research customer service, online databases and forums, industry blue books, and observations from the restoration of these pieces themselves. Um, and we'll provide a list below of those uh, uh, resources in case uh, you want to look into them further. Um, and then the final thing I need to cover is just a quick warning. We are going to be looking inside of these units and if you're going to be following along you're doing so at your own risk. There's high voltages involved in these units. Uh, so um, just observe the the proper safety considerations and if you're uncomfortable in any way make sure to um, you know pass that service on or that uh, tube swapping on to a qualified professional. In the first section of this video, we're going to be covering um, version identification and production year of the SP3. So before we start looking at the physical things that will identify which version you have, I want to cover some brief history. So uh, Audio Research started um, or announced the SP3 in 1971 and started producing it from 72 to 76. And during that time, it moved through three versions. The SP3 retailed for $595, the A695, and the A1795. And this happened kind of in rapid succession. Um, it looks like there was a lot of changes around 1974. Uh, so the changes that took place are mostly related to the power supply circuitry. Um, and that's kind of like a theme with the SP3. Each improvement was a big change to the power supply. So there's a B and a C version of the SP3 also that people may not be aware of. And uh, those are all based on the original production run. There was no SP3s produced after 76. Um, anything you see B and C after that were just circuit modifications to the original runs. So in 1978, Audio Research released the SP6 to preamp. And during that time, they sent out a newsletter to uh, current owners of the previous versions of the SP3, and they basically stated that the SP6 was, uh, in essence, an SP3 without the um, uh, tone control and, and tape loop circuitry. Uh, and what they did is they said, for a set price, which at the time was $470, you could send your unit into ARC through your dealership. Now, what that uh, upgrade included was a brand new power supply PCB with a whopping 11 filter cans. And after doing a restoration on these, I can't imagine trying to rebuild a B version. It's gotta be insane. Uh, so 11 power supply uh, or electrolytic cans. Um, the main tube PCB was modified to fit that, that new power supply circuitry. They put in new volume and balance controls, a new set of tubes. Uh, instead of triggering on the outlets just with this button, they added a relay kind of right in front of the power transformer to trigger that. Modified the circuitry so instead of a neon here, it works on a regular incandescent lamp. And they offered a three-year uh, warranty with a 90-day warranty for tubes. So overall, that was a pretty cool upgrade that they offered at the time. I think that's probably the rarest of the five versions um, because I think it would have been a lot of money back then to spring to, to upgrade to that, uh, to that unit. The final version of the SP3 was released in 2001. And this is, again, another modification of the original series. So... This is a modification called the SP3C, and it's still offered by Audio Research um, to this day. So as of uh, May 15th, 2020, they're still offering this upgrade. Uh, and that 
offers a new power supply, kind of similar to what they did with the B version where they have all these years of designing tube preamps and have come up with ways to make really stable uh, controlled power supplies. So they put the technology from their current production models into uh, an older SP3. Um, and they also, during that upgrade, will change out all of the RCA jacks on the back and put in a new volume control. Now, pricing on that C version is kind of in flux depending on uh, you know parts availability and other things. So if you're interested in getting the, the C modification done to your SP3 by audio research, be sure to contact them directly uh, to get a current pricing quote. Um, one last thing to mention on the different series, all three of these sound different. I'm sure the B sounds different. Uh, there's a general consen consensus online that the C version also changes the sound of the unit. Now that's going to be an assess assessment that you have to make yourself. So I'm not going to, you know, say that a stock restored unit is going to be better than a C version. It's just going to sound different. So just be aware of that. So, um, Next up, we're gonna jump into your identification for that. We're gonna spin the units around. So I've now got the stack of SP3 spun around and they're arranged from earliest to latest. So the SP3 is on top, the A in the middle, and the A1 on the bottom. Now, when we saw the front of these, there's basically nothing you can really look at on the front to tell you the version. I noticed some, some difference in the weight of the text, but it's nothing that you could really identify from a picture um, if, one is one version or the other. So our best bet for a quick identification is looking at the serial number. So first off, production year is going to be the first two digits reversed. So we've got 1974, 1974, and 1976. We can see that the model numbers read SP-3 for the first two and SP-3 a1 for the last one. So the challenge is going to be differentiating a SP3 from an SP3A. So the way we do that, if we look at the last digit of the serial number, that A is going to designate that this was a series A off the production line. Now what can get confusing here is uh, any of these versions could have been upgraded by ARC to a, to a different version, you know, during different production ranges. So what you'll see on some of them is you might have an SP3, but it'll have a sticker on the back that says A1, and then a sticker on the inside by the power transformer that says A1. Uh, and and uh, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So this is usually a good indicator of what it started out as, but in order to really um, nail it down, we're gonna have to look at the inside. Another um, thing to look at, and I don't know if this is consistent for all of them, but the, uh, it seems like the A and the A1 both have the ability to, to switch to 220 volt mains operation where uh, this one is designed just to run at, uh, you know, US AC mains at around 120 volts. So next up, we'll take a look at the inside and see what kind of clues we can get from the uh, power supply PCBs. So from left to right, I have earliest to latest, SP3, SP3A, and the SP3A1. So these units have been rebuilt. So uh, if your unit has not been recapped yet, it's going to look a little bit different on the inside and I'll explain that. But if you do have a restored unit, if somebody has done uh, you know similar analysis to, to what I've done, you're gonna end up with a uh, circuit layout that looks kind of like this. So let's go over the, the CAN identification. So uh, it's actually pretty easy to remember. The SP3 has four CANs. The A has five cans and the A1 has six cans. Now what I mean by that is on the originals, I'll throw up a picture of these. There's a capacitor can here, 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 and here. So they've been replaced with groups of discrete electrolytic capacitors on this restoration. On the A, you'll have a group of you know, one and two here, one, two here, and a third one here. Sorry, a fifth one here. And on the final one, there's going to be six. There'll be a grouping of three in this area and a grouping of three in this area. Now that may be uh, kind of confusing or hard to tell, so let me point out some other telltale signs. So an earlier one, most likely an SP3, uh, you're only gonna see two black wires coming into this transformer. On the later versions, they have the option to switch into uh, 240 volt. So there's multiple uh, primaries. So you'll see more wires coming out of the transformer. And you may notice that the, um, 
the transformer on the original is slightly smaller than the newer ones. Next up, on the SP3, you can see this kind of big capacitor hanging right off the back panel. On the later versions, they relocated that circuit to the power supply PCB. So if you see um, that circuit located the PCB, you probably don't have an SP3. What else? These wires, this, the, the orange, red, and yellow wires are the secondaries coming out of the power transformer. And you'll see on the SP3 and the SP3A that they go in the order from bottom to top, orange, red, yellow. Because of the, the position of these voltage double air caps, it looks like ARC flipped these around a little bit. So on the A1, we've got yellow, orange, red. So that may be an identifier you can look for. And another thing that you should keep an eye out for, on some uh, SP3s, you may see a designation next to this transformer. Now this one's a bit of a mystery because there's no A1 sticker on the back and this power supply is definitely a Series A power supply. So I'm not exactly sure what this sticker means on the inside of this one. But from my research, I've heard that if they get factory upgraded, you may have a sticker here. So if your unit says SP3 on the back and you have a, a sticker on the inside and the outside that say A1 and you look inside of it and it has a power supply that looks like this, then you probably uh, had an SP3 that was upgraded to an A1 spec. Another interior feature that can help identify these is the arrangement of the Zener diodes. So this is an SP3. This uses a bunch of 100 volt Zeners and um, you can see they're kind of all populated in this square over here and there's their they're really tightly grouped in, in three or four specific areas. On the A, they kind of wrap around the outside edge and in this long string here. And then in the A1, it's similar, but they're a little bit tighter in the corner. So you have six of them grouped in the top, or on here, you only have those, those three coming along the top edge. One other thing that you might come across on these is what I would call a third party uh, power supply revision. And there's some of those floating around out there where various individuals have designed an upgraded uh, circuit and offered it as a kit. And from what I've seen in my research, it would consist of a, a additional PCB that gets mounted vertically in this area, kind of over here against the edge of the chassis. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so if your unit does not look like any of these three or the B and C pictures that I've shown, it's possible it's been uh, uh, you know fitted with a third party modification. So that does it for the identification. Next, I'll move on to um, some of the accessories that were available when these things were new in the 70s. Next, I'm just gonna do a brief description of the accessory options that were available for the SP3s back in the 1970s. Uh, for the faceplate's the most important one to note. There were three versions that I'm aware of. This version that you see on all of these, a gold version, and then a silver with an extension and holes for rack mounting. Um, now, I was told by Audio Research customer service that back in the 70s, if you ordered one of these to your dealer, you custom ordered it in. If you specified the black and gold faceplate option, that was no additional charge. If you wanted to purchase an a la carte, there was obviously a charge for that. The only other accessory that I'm aware of is the WC-1 wood cabinet. And what that consisted of was a strip of wood for each of the sides and then one that was about half the length of the top that goes across the top to leave um, a little bit of venting area for the po uh, power supply to breathe. Uh, and then it just had like a, a couple metal straps on the bottom that would screw into the bottom of the unit. Uh, so those are, those are pretty rare and hard to find. Um, so if you uh, come across an SP3 with one of those, definitely pick it up. All right, let's take a look at the features of the SP3. So first of all, this is an all-tube preamp. Uh, it uses eight 12AX7s. It has very limited semiconductors in the circuit. They're only in the power supply. So that's the rectifier diodes, the pass transistor, and the Zener diodes for uh, the regulated voltage reference. The power supply consists of a regulated high voltage supply and then two independent DC filament circuits, which power all of the, the, um, the filaments for the vacuum tubes. DC filaments are generally quieter than AC uh, powered filaments. And in this case, one of the supplies is referenced to ground and the other one is elevated above ground for the uh, direct coupled final tube in each of the three stages, line stage, tone circuit, and phono stage. 
Certain versions of this, as we saw, have switches on the back for alternate mains voltages. Uh, one thing to mention there is if you do end up purchasing this and you're overseas and you have it on the 240 volt option, make sure to change the fuse accordingly and there's a note about that on the back. The phono stage in this unit uses 312AX7s. They're located in this section back here uh, behind the, the selector control. And that phono stage is optimized for moving magnet cartridges that are looking for a 47K nominal load. We have two tape inputs uh, that can be individually selected for monitoring here, in addition to tuner, spare, and a selection of uh, tape one and two on the selector here without overriding in this position. The mode switch, uh, we have a few different settings here. Mono will take the signal from both channels, combine it together, and, and output it equally. Stereo maintains the original signal coming into the unit. Reverse just flips this around. And a lot of people might look at this and be like, why would you need that? Um, I actually use it quite a bit uh, in repair circumstances and for quick troubleshooting. If I notice that maybe one channel is weak uh, or has an issue, I'll use that reverse and see if it flips sides. There, there's various things that you can do with that. Um, it also helps you establish if you've done your connections properly. I have certain reference recordings that I know are mixed hard left at the very beginning. So um, I usually use that um, just as a quick check to make sure my stereo orientation is correct. Left and right, this will just take the signal from the left, combine it to both speakers, signal from the right only, combine it to both speakers. So in most cases, you'll be in stereo listening mode, but these additionals are great for troubleshooting. Um, and that's about it for that. So volume control, the only thing I wanna mention here is uh, it's consistent in the upgrade options that Audio Research offered to alter this volume control. The original can get a little bit weird in tracking, which we'll see a little bit later when I go through the, um, the servicing section. Um, so these have all been upgraded to a, an Alps uh, pot. And one thing to be aware of, if you got really lucky, I don't know exactly when they were doing this, but on, on certain, uh, uh, revisions or service, these volume controls are replaced with a really nice step unit. That control is no longer offered. So this is, this is like a smooth Alps pot. This one is the same spec, but it has detents, so you can see that it clicks as you go. That's, the, that's a really nice control on that one. Um, next up is the tone circuit. You engage the tone circuit by pushing this button here. This contour knob is kind of weird. It's actually when you when you flip it full to the right or all the way uh, clockwise and have the the line pointing towards the dot that's basically as close to out of circuit as possible and then as you turn it to the left this adjusts the mid-range frequency so i'll throw up a graph of this so you can see what i'm talking about so that is kind of your your mid-range adjustment and it changes the overall sound it kind of drops the volume down a little bit as well and then of course we have bass and treble controls and I'll put up the graphs of these as well so you can see the cutoff frequencies. And then the final one is balance. Uh, and the thing that I want to drive home in this control is it has a wide overlap. So if we were to look at this on an oscilloscope, what you would see is as we approach the center, the signals are completely balanced. And then if I take this to the, to the left, it's not going to boost the, the signal of the left speaker. It's just going to stay at the level it was here as you go and the opposite in this direction. And what happens is there's a range about anywhere from, from here to here where there's not going to be any change because those tracks inside of this potentiometer are over, overlapping uh, to a certain degree. So if you don't have to like be super meticulous about getting this right in the dot, as long as you get it close, it's going to be no problem. Next up, I'm gonna talk about power on and power off considerations for the SP3. So the way that, that this works is when we power on the SP3 with this left uh, preamp button here, this green light's gonna turn on, that's just the preamp. If we depress the outlets button, the red indicator will come on and the switched outlets on the back will turn on. Now, Audio Research recommends using those outlets. I don't think it's the greatest idea depending on how current hunger your amp is, uh, but if you wanted to hook an amp up to the switched outlets, the way that they recommend you run it is you leave the outlets button depressed and then you just push this on and off and it'll turn your power amp and preamp on and off together. That's all well and good if you're running a tube amplifier. If you're running a solid state amp, it can be a little bit troublesome 
And the reason is there's like a power on transient that happens here, which I'll demonstrate. It puts a large DC offset on the output. And this can be particularly troublesome for uh, DC coupled solid state power amplifiers. So what audio research recommends in the service manual is if you're using a uh, solid state amplifier, power on the preamp first. So you'd power this on and you're gonna let it sit for 20 to 30 seconds and then turn on your power amplifier. And then you would do the reverse at power off. You'd turn off your amp and then you'd wait, make sure that your, your amplifier is not going to be outputting any signals. And then you turn off the preamp to avoid any spike when you turn it off. When you're dealing with tube amplifiers, you don't really need to worry about that because the turn on characteristic uh, is a little bit different. The tubes need time to warm up and all the weird stuff that happens when you turn this on is gonna happen well before the amplifier can start putting out audio. Um, so we'll go through some demonstrations on that and I'll get into that a bit further. All right, I've got a demonstration set up here. Uh, very simple, it's just a uh, digital voltmeter connected to the RCA output of the SP3 and I'm just connected to the positive and the negative here. So we're directly measuring the DC offset at the output terminals of the SP3. Now, why is this important? If we power on the SP3 and we see a huge voltage jump, if you're dealing with a solid state amplifier that's on instantaneously, that sound is going to be um, transferred to the speakers. And if you're using a direct coupled amplifier circuit, uh, you might be in some trouble. So the service manual for the SP3 recommends a 20 to 30 second power on delay. In other words, power on the SP3, wait 20 to 30 seconds, and then turn on your amp. Now, with this, that seems acceptable, but I would uh, tend to push that a little bit more. My recommendation would be about two minutes if you can manage it. So let's go ahead and do this demonstration and you'll see what I'm talking about. So watch the, uh, the meter as I power on the SP3. You see that voltage spike? That's over 50 volts DC. Now, even on an AC coupled amplifier, what you might see is if you have your amp on while the SP3 is going through the startup sequence, your woofers are gonna be pulsing in and out. Um, worst case scenario, if you're a DC coupled amplifier and it doesn't have DC protection, you could do some serious damage to your speakers. So uh, we're now at around the 30 second mark that ARC recommends, and we're still over 500 millivolts DC. This is probably fine, but I'm gonna let this timer run out and we're gonna see what happens around two minutes and then see how long exactly it takes on this specific SP3 to get down to the uh, you know, couple of millivolt level. All right, we just hit the two minute mark and we're at around 50 millivolts DC. I think this is plenty safe at this point. Um, so my recommendation would be try to wait two minutes if you can, if you're using a solid state power amplifier. All right, right around three minutes, 15 seconds. You can see we've zeroed out. I'm gonna to switch to the millivolt scale for a little bit more accuracy here. So right around a millivolt of DC offset. This is gonna fluctuate as this thing stabilizes. Uh, but at this point, you're definitely safe. So the main point of this is just to show if you're running a solid state amplifier, especially a DC coupled amplifier, be sure to to give this a good long wait at power up before you power on your amp. All right, now let's look at the reverse. If we power off the SP3, we're also going to see a DC offset. It's not gonna be as bad. You can see it's climbing to negative, I think it goes around negative eight to negative 10 volts. So obviously we want to avoid presenting that uh, DC condition to the amplifier at power off. So the simple way to avoid this is turn off your power amp first. So you're done listening, turn off the power amp, and then you can go ahead and turn off the SP3 right behind it. Just uh, make sure that um, you know your amplifier's topology. If it has relay switching uh, for the speaker protection, you should be fine if it takes a while for your power amplifier to kind of settle down and it's still, you know, if you, the test is if you were to play music through it and power it off, if it slowly tapers off, you're gonna have to wait a little bit before turning off the SP3. But if you hear a relay click and it goes silent, you're okay to power it off.
In this section, I'd like to cover common failure points of the SP3 and uh, what I'd consider routine service on this unit. So starting off with the simple stuff, on any piece of vintage equipment, you always want to start with the controls. A lot of intermittent scratchy noises and, and things like that can be traced down to various potentiometers and switches. So getting all those cleaned is kind of the first line of defense. Um, second, if you're having an, an intermission, intermittent issue, uh, vacuum tubes can be um, the problem. Fortunately, with this unit, it uses all the same tubes in all positions. So if you're running into an issue and say you've got noise in the left channel, regardless of source, that would kind of isolate you to uh, the line stage, right? So what you could do is use one of the um, tone circuit tubes and temporarily swap those positions, you know, swap this one into here. See if your issue goes away. Uh, if it doesn't, put the original tube back, take the tone circuit tube and put it in a different one and see if the issue goes away. And that way you can kind of track down if a certain tube is, is causing an issue. And now keep in mind, you could have a vacuum tube that measures great on a tube tester, but when you put it in circuit under full load under the conditions of a specific design, it could start acting up. Um, some of the more advanced stuff, power supply, this section back here. I would consider this almost a required uh, maintenance on this unit. Uh, reason being, it's basically a ticking time bomb. So in all three of the SP3s that are featured in this series, every single one of them had capacitor failure in the power supply. And it, regardless of version, SP3, SP3A, SP3A1. And um, the SP3, the earliest one we had, was almost a museum grade example. It's completely stock um, and everything was measuring dead on. But what ended up happening is after we ran it at modern mains voltages for an extended period of time, four to five hours, we ended up with what we considered catastrophic capacitor failure. So this is one of the capacitor cans from that SP3. And you can see that it has overheated, expanded, broke this plastic shield and leaked its guts all over the place. So what happens with these is over time, there's a chemical reaction that can take place within the, the capacitor um, and end up degrading it and increasing its equivalent series resistance, in turn causing more heat, and eventually that heat builds up and, and the uh, uh, electrolyte inside has to go somewhere. And at that point, you're spilling potentially conductive material on this parts of the circuit and shorting stuff out, and it just becomes a mess. So because of the capacitor issue alone, I'd say have a professional rebuild your power supply or send your unit out to ARC to do the Series C modification. While we're on the subject of the power supply, the other uh, common failure point is, well, not necessarily a failure point, but just routine maintenance. These Zener diode reference uh, strings, they run hot and heat up the PCB and weaken the solder joint. So that's something that should be addressed if you're having this unit serviced. And one of the more you know, obscure issues uh, we came across in this specific SP3A1 where in both the tone or both the, the treble and the bass controls, we had an issue where in part of the control, uh, the volume would just spike uh, in one channel. And what we found is that the carbon track inside of the control itself is gone. You can see that kind of brown patch there. So when you rotate this control, you're actually causing the circuit to do things that it's not supposed to. So those are most of the common failure points. I didn't see really anything crazy going on in the main PCB. This is a lot of mil spec uh, components, film capacitors that don't tend to have issues. Um, so this section is usually pretty good for the most part, but it's a good idea to go in and measure your carbon composition resistors to make sure they haven't drifted and just look for general, general signs of um, uh, heat stress. Another area that you may want to address if you're having this unit serviced is the volume control. What I found is that the stock volume controls in these, although they worked, they their performance wasn't really up to spec. There's some play in the shaft on the original controls, meaning that uh, as you spin it towards the right, maybe the levels come up uh, you know, together, synchronized, but when you switch directions and turn to the left, one of the channels might be slightly out of balance with the other. Um, and there's really no way around that besides replacing the control. So on 
the three units that we had, one of them had already had the volume control upgraded by uh, ARC with a um, step potentiometer with detents in it. That was really nice. I was able to source an equivalent uh, control from the same manufacturer. It doesn't have the detents in it, but it's a, a really nice high quality Alps control. Um, and we found that that really improved the performance on the volume control. So I'll show a, a short demonstration on the oscilloscope of that. Right now we're looking at the output of the SP3A1 and I'm feeding a one kilohertz test tone into it. And this is with the volume control at maximum. So what I've got going on is on one trace, I have uh, one channel and the other trace is the other channel. So we can see that they're, they're closely tracking to one another with the volume control maxed out or as close to out of circuit as possible. But on these older controls, what you can get sometimes is a little bit of wobble in the shaft and uh, some inconsistency in the carbon track. So it's just a demonstration of what you might uh, expect to see on one of these stock volume controls. So I'm gonna start to pull this down and we'll see as I get closer to zero that one channel deviates from the other in volume. Now this is at such a minimal level that you wouldn't hear it, um, and, uh, but it's, it's something to keep in mind and that's why we end up swapping these out with a newer control. So the other thing to notice on this right now, I'm just wobbling the, there's a little bit of play in the shaft here. So what happens is as you come down, they get further apart, but then when you when you turn it the opposite direction to start to come up, they actually tend to get a little bit closer just because of the, the inherent wobble in the shaft. And then again, as we go to max volume, you can see that they're equal. So that's kind of the test. If I, if I max out the volume and I see they're equal, I know I don't have an issue with my balance circuit or my tubes, it's just the volume control. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap this one out to a, uh, uh, a new Alps control and we'll retest and see how it looks. All right, I've now got the new Alps control installed. Everything else is equal, nothing has changed with the test signal setup. So this is volume maxed out. And then as I come down, you can see a much closer channel tracking. In this section, we're gonna cover vacuum tubes in the SP3. So the reason I like to cover this topic is because if you're not informed on how the vacuum tubes work in your specific piece of equipment, you may end up spending money where you don't need to. So the easiest way to, to show that is to um, go through the functions of each of these vacuum tube sections in the SP3. So starting out, these three tubes here are responsible for the line stage. That means your auxiliary, your tuner, your tape decks, um, are all going to travel through these three tubes. These two um, run the, the tone or the EQ circuit. So one of the cool things about the SP3 is when you disengage the tone circuit, all of this is taken completely out, it's bypassed. So what I wanna drive home here is, if you never plan to, to listen with the tone circuit engaged, don't go spending $50, $60 a piece on new old stock 12AX7s for these two positions. It's not gonna do you any good. These three here are for the moving magnet phono stage. So what, um, what I'd like to, to focus on here is the concept that the phono stage runs through the line stage. So the signal comes in from your turntable, it goes through these three tubes, and then, uh, after the selector switch, it goes into the line stage and then finally out. So if you're a vinyl junkie and you're thinking, oh, I'm just gonna upgrade these three so I get really good phono, it's still gotta run through through the line stage. So you really do need to upgrade or, or change out all three of these and all three of these if you're looking for you know the best of the best performance out of the phono stage. The next concept that I'd like to cover is the specific function of the 12AX7 in the SP3 circuit. So first of all, let's look at the 12AX7. So the 12AX7 is a small bottle, all glass tube with nine pins. And if you look at the inside of it, you can see that it's symmetrical. This is what's called a dual triode. There's actually two vacuum tubes, I guess you could say, inside of this uh, glass enclosure. And there's two major ways that this can get used in a circuit. You either have a tube dedicated to one channel where one stage feeds into the first triode, then it goes through some circuitry and back into the second triode, and, uh, and that tube stays in one channel for its, you know, for its service. The other way to do it is to, to split it in half, basically, and use one half for one channel and one half for the other. In the SP3, 
every single one of these 12AX7s operates in that second mode. They're all split left channel, right channel. And it's not, um, you know, all these bottom sections are, are right channel, all these top to the left, uh, they've, they've alternated between stages. So you'd be something like that for the right channel and that for the left channel, and then it, it switches as you go. The reason that that's important to know is for tube ordering and selection. Now, when you when you were, are ordering tubes, you'll often you know see an upgraded price or or a little bit higher price for what are called matched pairs. And the thing to know about that is usually when when these are getting matched up, what the what the supplier is doing is they're they're gain matching the tubes. Basically, if you were to add the two triode sections together, you would end up with a um, uh, a certain number and then they would match that so you could have one tube that one triad is slightly weaker But the other one's slightly stronger and that would match up perfectly with another tube that was identically balanced so In in this case a gain match tube is not going to do the trick because what you could end up with is a left channel that has slightly different characteristics than the right slightly, you know uh, Quieter than the other channel maybe a little bit different sonically because of the way that it functions in the circuit so when you are ordering replacement tubes for an SP3, you have to look for triode matched sets. Um, and the thing to understand about that is in order to match both sections together, what you need is a high tube count, right? You need to start with a big batch of tubes so that you can go through them, pop them in the tester, and start matching up triode sections. And what I suggest is don't make it super difficult for the supplier. If you ask for a set of eight matched triode tubes, it's going to be a little bit harder for them to select those. And you may end up, you know, getting some sort of compromised quality or, or restrict your selection to only being able to use current production tubes. Um, the, the better thing to ask for is each one of those sections that we went over. So you want to get a matched set of three for here, a matched set of three for here, and a matched set of two for here. It's going to be much easier for the supplier to, to, to match up and give you a good set of tubes that way. And that'll allow you to uh, experiment a little bit too. So one of the beauties of this piece is all the tubes are 12AX7, so you can experiment with positions. So for example, you could get some new old stock uh, Joint Army Navy GE tubes or something like that for this section, get them triode matched by the supplier so that all three of them have the same exact specs. You could get a set of, you know, uh, Russian uh, Sovtex or something over here in the phono stage. And you could actually take these three, stick them in this circuit, pull these three, put them over there. And that would allow you to listen to the difference that a different tube type might cause in the line stage without having to have, you know, you could just use the set within, within your own piece. So I really suggest um, uh, doing that when you order uh, tubes, tubes for this unit is if you, if you like to, to tube roll and, and swap things out and experiment, you know, get a set of three that's different from over here and that'll allow you to do some other things. Um, and again, keep in mind, these ones, if you're going to use the circuit, definitely get triode match tubes. If you're not going to use it, um, maybe just use the best set of older 12AX7s that came in it. Um, and that way you're not dumping a bunch of money into, into tubes that you might not be using. All right, now I'm going to show you how to take the cover off of an SP3. Now, if you're following along with this, you're doing so at your own risk. There's lethal voltages present inside of this unit. Um, so just be aware of the, the safety before you uh, attempt to do any sort of tube rolling in this unit. So just some recommendations on how to stay safe with this. Be sure to unplug the unit from the wall. Don't just power it off. Don't take that risk. Unplug that from the wall and let this sit for about 5 to 10 minutes to allow the power supply to drain. All right, first recommendation. The screws on this are a quarter inch hex head with a slot. You can use either a flathead screwdriver or a quarter inch uh, socket bit. I don't recommend using a screwdriver because you're, you have a lot more of a tendency to slip while you're trying to spin this out, especially if the screw's tight. And on this specific one, you can see just that has happened in the past. And you see kind of this line that went off of here. Someone probably slipped with a screwdriver and, uh, and away they went. So what I recommend is using a uh, um, quarter inch magnetic uh, bit. These work really well. So there's 10 screws total, three on each side on the bottom, and then four on the top. All right, 
And there's nothing on the back. This is just a bent sheet, so this will come straight off. I wanted to take this opportunity to do a quick high voltage demonstration on the SP3. When we're suggesting that you wait before swapping tubes out, we don't just make this stuff up. You can see at the highest voltage point in this power supply, we're over 500 volts DC. That's no joke. Um, and when we power this down, we'll start a timer here. You'll see that we're still well over 200 volts, you know, 10 seconds in. You don't want to just be powering this off reaching around in there, swapping tubes. It's ideal to, you know, to wait at least five minutes for this thing to, you know, completely drain off. Now, this isn't an across the board recommendation for all tube devices. Each device is uh, unique. And even the three SP3s that I'm, you know, showing in this video series, there's going to be variation between them because of the topologies and the different parts that are in them. So. You know, definitely if you're, if you're doing anything, swapping tubes inside of a unit like this, uh, you're doing so at your own risk. It's a lot safer on some of the other units where the tubes are exposed on the outside of the chassis. Um, but on this one, you're definitely reaching around areas, you know, in here and around the sockets that have high voltage present. Once you've unplugged the unit and waited the requisite time for the power supply to drain and it's now safe to, to be inside, uh, to remove a tube, I just have a couple recommendations. So I'm wearing a cotton glove here just because my hands are a little bit oily. But, uh, you know, if you were dealing with $50, $60 tubes, you might want to do this. But, uh, you know, just a plain old 12AX7, uh, just touching it with your fingers is fine. The worst that's going to happen is you get some fingerprints on it. The biggest concern is you want to get those fingerprints off and you've got a risk of, um, uh, accidentally rubbing off the information on the tube. So again, that becomes more of a concern when you're dealing with high-end old stock tubes. You don't want to wipe off the GE or RCA logo or the 12AX7 designation. So gloves if you're um, crazy and worried about it, but it's not going to be a big deal if you touch it with your fingers. So we're just going to firmly grab the tube and then kind of wiggle it in a clockwise direction as we pull up and then extract it from the socket. Now on 12AX7, sorry, where's the camera? On the 12AX7, you can see there's a spot where there's, uh, you know, a gap between the two pins. You're going to use that as an index to line this up in the correct spot. So just look at the tube socket, where you can see the um, the two that are spaced out there. I like to kind of tilt it and get those two lined up first, and kind of get it set, and make sure that everything is right, and then give it some downward pressure. And again. Just rotate in a clockwise or counterclockwise method until it's firmly seated. Our final section is all about the SP3 lamps. So on the SP3 we have two lamps, a green indicator on the left and a red indicator on the right. The green indicator is tied to the power switch and lets you know when the, uh, when the preamp is on. And then the second switch controls the switched outlets on the back and that indicates red to tell you your switched outlets are on. So one thing to keep in mind is that these two bulbs are not the same. One is a 28 volt incandescent and one is a higher voltage neon lamp. So you can't interchange these. I guess the temptation is if you're running this all the time and this one happens to burn out and you don't have a spare bulb laying around you would just grab this one out and put it over here. Uh, it doesn't work like that. And if we look at the schematic, you'll see why. The green one is powered from the one of the filament supplies, and the red one is powered from the AC mains that switch to feed the outlets on the back through a little rectifier circuit. So let's go over how to swap one of these out. So if this one burnt out on us, what we're going to do is just grab it firmly and give it a twist counterclockwise. And this is just going to come out of a threaded insert. It's kind of like a threaded fuse uh, style thing. I'm gonna pull this out. This is what it looks like. So it's a colored lens on a metal shaft with a thread. And then the lamp 
is actually fed in from the back. So where that little line is on the back, that's what we're gonna to use to pop this out. So the tool that I like to use for this is a flush cutters. Anything that's thin and flat should be able to get this out, so a razor blade or something like that. So what I'm gonna do is just get this tool lined up right here. And all I have to do is just get enough of this backed out that I can grab it and pull it. Okay. So that is our little 28 volt lamp. This is a 387 bulb. All right, let's take a look at the neon. So same thing, I'm just going to grab firmly and twist counterclockwise. You can see same exact configuration even though it's a different bulb inside. You can't blame somebody for thinking that it's no problem just to swap these out. Well, that's not the case. Let's go ahead and pull this one out. All right, so that's our neon lamp. The model on this one is NE. 2J. Now one thing to keep in mind here, if you happen to have the rare SP3B version, they made a modification to the circuit to make these the same. So on the B version there's a relay installed right by the power transformer that, uh, that drives the power outlets on the back. So if you have a B, you'll have to check. Both of your lamps might be identical in that one. All right, so that does it for the lamps. Again, this is Ben with SkyFi Audio. I hope you enjoyed our presentation today on the Audio Research SP3. If you enjoyed this content and want to see more, please subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. You can also visit our website, skyfiaudio.com, S-K-Y-F-I audio.com. You'll see some links below in the video description to see our latest arrivals. Thank you so much.